Okay, there we go. So um, we said we would like to talk about sense making. And I guess uh, you mean when we talk about it, collective sense making, right? Yeah, in fact, actually, what I'm particularly interested in is the what even is collective sense making? I thought I used to know something about that, but my story is that I know very, very little about what collective sense making is. And um, and I'm interested in it in a couple counts. I'm interested in it because in my community, there was so much difficulty doing any kind of um, collective sense making about the pandemic. And now I'm thinking about all the stuff around AI and I'm watching who people trying to make sense of it. And I don't think there's very much collective sense making being done about it. And I have my background in Quaker process and sense of the meeting and my understanding of that as a form of collective sense making, but I'm also realizing how limited that is. And I think there's a huge confusion between um tools for alignment for collective alignment and the tooling for collective sense making i think they get collapsed and so i'm wanting to understand what collective sense making is which is what we need to do before we come to collective alignment like voting or all of these patterns that you see that people are talking about of about uh, when they talk about sense making, they typically end up in action. But I think there's something really different about, like, if you think about voting, and voting is the place where, so you vote about something, and therefore, you know what the collective wanted. Well, what you know is what the threshold of the vote level of people yes. wanted, which is not the same thing as the collective yes. knowledge. And, and sense of the meeting well, that's much closer to collective sense making because people explicitly are saying they're trying to understand the sense of the meeting, which is the sense of the whole. But the methodologies that are available for sense making inside of that are very low, or there's a small number of them, and there's not an explicit understanding of the dimensionality of sense making. And so this is the inquiry that I'm in, which is what kind of meta pattern could I come up with that could be useful in my community and also at work in other contexts where we can do all of that sense making that comes before alignment and action. So let's clarify things here. When you say sense making, do, do you mean that people uh, through an emerging process, people come to share the same a narrative, for instance, because narrative no. talk about sense. Or, uh, so, would you, you know, become more say more specific things between like sense making, consensus, uh, so, and all those things? Because it has you lots just, of ingredients in this. Yeah. What you just said was exactly how I think people think about it. That yes. collective sense making is when a group of people come to see something the same way. Exactly. And I'm not interested in that mm -hmm. because that's alignment of individuals to some thing. I'm mm -hmm. not interested in alignment. What I'm interested in is how does the collective sense? How does it actually expand its capacity to sense? And I don't even know what it means. What does it really mean for a collective, a, the collective, not the individuals, the collective to have made sense of something? So it obviously has to do with taking advantage of all of the different sensory capacity of each of the individuals and making that capacity of each individual available to all of the individuals. But it's not about the alignment. We can talk about alignment and yeah, individuals yeah, yeah. inside a group coming in to, to believe a thing or the group taking action because I don't, it doesn't matter. The group could take action because the president said so. And But it's really different if the president, the one person who's deciding what to do, has all of the information of all of the individuals in some way or more of them. Like that's a whole separate problem. I think teasing them apart is precisely the point. Does this help? Yes, well, I, I still uh, would like us to to clarify all this uh, all those things because it has lots of ingredients. So, for instance, you talked about sensing, uh, and what difference would you put between 
sensing and sense making? Do, 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 do we first need to sense, for instance, before we sense make, <laughs> or it makes sense? Well, that's so that's interesting. So there, what you're talking about is the distinction between uh, a thing that has to do with the processing of the sense. So this is what I've mm -hmm. got going. I've got a chart up right behind me that I'm looking at that I was working out with, um, working on. So there are all of these different channels of awareness that we have access to. And so the, like the so the thing that I'm trying to do is first of all what is the dimensionality of sense making what what would the actual dimensions the different things that are needed so one of them is do we understand all of the different channels of awareness that we have that are available to the whole right so individuals have this their emotional sensing they have their body awareness they have their reasoning they have um the data they collect from authoritative sources outside of their collective group. They have um, the data that comes from experimentation. They have, so I, and I, I want to include in these awareness channels, things like when a person says, I'm concerned that, or I need why, I feel like those, that's an awareness channel. A statement of a need or a statement of concern is an awareness channel that an individual has. And there can be lots of reasons for that. And, and so the question is this, what are the awareness channels that are available? That's one dimension. And so the process that I'm thinking about is, okay, you start by asking the group for a collection of statements from all of their different channels. You say, what are you, what are you aware of around some topic, whatever the topic is, whether it's AI or, um, covid or you know in a community where should people park right all different levels like what do you and then seeing what data shows up for that and then there's a process of re refinement of going deeper of saying okay you had that sense where does that sense come from and so th that part starts to be part of the process of sense making because you just do that in 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 the group setting Sorry, clarification here. Where do that sense come from? You mean the source of that sense or how do I make the sense already? Because I may receive you know, data and I may perceive that with my own subjectivity in a complete different way. We know how su the subjective self can completely transform something. So how would you clarify this, this part? Depending how it lands on my belief system, my sensitivity, my personal history, I will have a very different filter uh, or way to select the points of the source that comes to me, right? Yeah, and I think that's. But I think part of the point about this is that we in the in the collective, the individuals are not aware of all of the groundings mm -hmm. from which these experiences along a channel come from. And so, part of collective sense making is having the individuals in the collective know what the groundings are that other individuals in the collective have. And so by groundings, what I'm talking about is things like ethics, morals, assumptions, frames, whatever these groundings, the places you start from that are the, that, that are, I think the things you're talking about. So I think that one of the things that collective sense making is about is the process by which a lot of the parties understand all of the different groundings that are available. Part of the reason why we need collective sense making right now is because the grounding is shifting so much. The grounds is shifting so much and so many people with so many different grounds are coming together. Mm -hmm. So... So the process would be a simple process to start. Like I think of this as a meta process in a sense of collect the, these statements, these statements that come from the awareness channels, then spend a little bit of time um, going deeper into where and why and how do those things come just, and their statements, they just get recorded. 
because the other thing that I think is we're trying to do, like the the meta dimensionality of sense making, it involves knowing what all of the different channels are that we have available for awareness. It involves discovering groundings, but it also it involves discovering the dimensionality of the space that mm -hmm. you're talking about. What is the dimensionality of um, the issues around machine learning? What are the what's the dimensionality of the issues around the pandemic? And some of the and, and I'm not I'm not totally sure about this because so we have the dimensions of sense making, but then we have the dimensions of the problem space that, or the the inquiry space that we're looking at, and oftentimes we don't even know the dimensionality of that space. So part of collective sense making is discovering the dimensionality of the space as a whole, not just as individuals. And when I say as a whole, I don't know what I mean. I think most often people don't know what they mean when they say that. Like I think this is precisely the place where there's a lot of slipperiness. What do we mean when we say as a whole, as a collective? And that's, that's actually what this inquiry for me is about, is what do we mean for there to have been collective sense made? Like, when would you say, oh, we have a unit of collective sense now? <laughs> well, you, you presume two important things here. First, you presume that people have the capacity to see their, to see their own ground. Uh, which in reality seems very unlikely, at least in my experience. It takes a lot and a lot and a lot of time and personal uh, growth and self-knowledge before you start to even begin to understand uh, your own ground. Uh, and of course, we can help each other. I, I can certainly help you see your own ground because of my difference with you and vice versa, which we do a lot, by the way, in our conversations. Uh, so conversations need, seem to have like a very important role. And the second thing, you presume that we can objectivize those things. We can give names, tags, uh, dimensionality to all these things. And can we? I don't know. So for the first one, I'm not presuming that. Okay. What I'm presuming is that there would be collective sense made as we discover what the grounding is. I am totally presuming that we don't know what the ground is that we're standing on mm -hmm. and presume that it's shifting and we don't know it. It's changing and we don't know it. And we don't, especially we, we see other people's experiences, other people's statements of their awareness is through our ground, not through their ground. And that's to me, part of the main thing here is discovering what their ground is so that we can make sense of their statement because we can't even make sense of their statements or their awareness if we don't know what their ground is. Or to the degree to which our ground doesn't match theirs, we will misunderstand their statements. Mm -hmm. And so collective sense has to do with understanding people's awarenesses, which means understanding their grounds, which means discovering it. And that's part of the point. I don't think, I mean, sometimes you can know what the assumptions are that you're making, but it is because we're engaged in this kind of process that you might discover that. That's part part one. I'm not presuming that. Okay. I'm presuming the opposite, in fact. Um, and but but oftentimes, once we have discovered our ground, then we can talk about it and share. This is the ground that I came from, and so that can be that can then become because this is part of why I want this meta process that understands that the dimensionality of sense making includes discovery of groundings, so that it's obvious, it's externalized, and we are like looking for that because it's like, oh, okay, I have this ethics. Oh, okay, I do presume that the world is flat or circular, or I do presume time operates in a certain way or oh i discovered i do presume things about intent i mean there's so many different realms of things where i've discovered uh that was what my assumption was and once you're in that space i think that's useful second thing you said um what was the second thing you said i presume yeah second that we can objectivize that that we can oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, know, that's speak great... that um put words in in this multi-dimensional space i mean words tags vectors uh, any kind of language to describe that, to objectivize that. That means to make it a shared reality that we can see each of us. Well, so insofar as it's impossible 
to create a shared external representation of something that mm -hmm. matters, we will not be able to make collective sense of it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it has to be words, but I think there does have to be an externalization of a sense. So if I have an awareness channel, I have to be able to externalize the information that came through the awareness channel for it to be shared into the collective. And so I'm not sure that that needs to be words. Like I'm actually literally imagining that one of the things one might do in this is, oh, um, I, I, so part of what I think is really interesting or important here is to have another dimensionality, which is what are the methodologies by which you um, extract information from the awareness channel that you have? And what are the methodologies that you have for bringing that awareness into the space? This is a starting methodology of just start talking about them. But, you know, you could use dance, you could use prayer, and then you you could use emotional expression of your face. You could use all these things. And in fact, I think that's actually really important is how many methodologies do we have? And can we increase the list of methodologies? And can we see when we're using a methodology for extracting sense that doesn't match the kind of sense we're trying to get. Like, I believe that there's probably also correlation between these different methodologies and channels and their usefulness to certain aspects of what sense making is about. So I do presume that there is going to be some way to externalize the sense that you have along a particular awareness channel. Yes. And if you can't, well, then we're not going to be able to have collective sense making about that. Does that make sense? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> well, so I still have, of course, uh, tons of um, of questions. Uh, let me let me go back a little bit and ask you again the difference you make between sense making and uh, storytelling, because all these things seem to happen through some forms of conversation and communication between. Uh, people in a system, right? Or even sure. agents, even even machines. You know, like they uh, they can also grab lots of um, data. They can sense lots of things also for the collective and contribute to that. So I would talk about agents, some as human beings and some as sensors here and there. Um, so anyway, it happens through conversations, and conversations happen through some kind of protocol and grammar. And we we've talked a lot about uh, those things. Yeah. Now, on the human level, it happens through conversation, which lead them to narratives. Like uh, after our conversation, I can speak with my partner and she would ask me, okay, what happened between you and Eric? And I would give a narrative, for instance, of what happened, okay? According to my own sensitivity. Um, so it seems we cannot not come up with narratives with, with shared or not shared, <laughs> divided narratives. Um, so uh, my question here, how do you distinguish sense-making with um narrative making let's let's put it this way and then i'll have some ideas with here to share with you but i'd like to stick to this question first well i'm not sure like if you wanted to you could end up it depends on how big your definition of narrative is and what you're thinking a narrative is so when i paint a picture is the painting of a picture a narrative? Is the picture itself a narrative? I mean, you can talk about it as a narrative if you want. You can look at a picture, a painting, and you can see a story that the painting evokes. You can have that. But I I don't I don't think I want to call that. Like to me, a narrative is something that involves a linear exposition over time. And that is one kind of sense making. Right. You tell a story, you basically situate something in time and you use a bunch of different narrative devices. And so, yes, narrative is a, a significantly large category of sense making that humans use because we have language built into our brain so much. And language is a linear thing. And so the, the story comes out in time and we weave all kinds of things together. So insofar as a painting is a narrative, insofar as a mathematical equation is a narrative, insofar as a computer program is a narrative, I don't know. I, I think it may mo make more sense to um, come up with 
a broader term for sense making than just narrative. Not to say that narratives aren't one of the more important ones because they are how we, what we're built in to do. So like after, like, so I'm, assu I'm assuming that to me, the thing is that collective sense making is the processes by which people go through that increases the relatedness in the circle of the people with the topic that the people were talking about. Like there become isomorphisms and resonances and transformations and and useful, more and more useful mappings between the, the domain of inquiry and the group of people together towards that domain. So if I drew a big UML diagram that looks like a computer program, if I actually embodied a bunch of inputs and sensors that's pulling the data as the group and I started adding those things in, if I have stories that... Um, people can use to orient and walk through processes. All of these things seem like they would be aspects and and abilities and additions to collective sense-making. But I don't think narrative is the only one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's super useful because humans use narratives as like little, like you, you've always used this term, uh, what do you call it? Um, concept vehicles, right? Yes. So the micro narratives that, do really well at transferring a bunch of data in a small amount of time. And I would think those are like micro narratives. And then you can have macro narratives. You can have a meme. What is a meme? A meme is a is a is a like a meme by the internet definition, not by the Dawkins definition, is a little image with some words that create an instant micro narrative that is funny and accessible and fits into a pattern of other micro narratives of the same type. It's a template for a bunch of those things. And so thereby you can create, you can do incredible amount of sense making by using a meme because it's a narrative that is a template, a specific instance usually of a template of other narratives. And the whole thing itself is a, it's like three or four levels stack templating where you're relating the story to other relations of the story to the bigger overall story that is then transmissible in a fraction of a second. It seems a little bit, that's like different than a narrative. A meme is, it's like, I don't know. There you go. That's the thought. Did mm -hmm. that answer your question in a long-winded way about narrative and sense-making? Yes. So I have things to to share and not definite ideas, but kind of my <laughs> in progress uh, and raw um, exploration of this. Um, so we had previous conversation about how I see uh, the evolution of consciousness and especially the one of uh, that Gene Gebser point, uh, you know, from a perspective from sorry, unperspectivism to perspectivism to a perspectivism. Um, and I think uh, the narrative forms bring us into a perspectival uh, form of consciousness because you connect different dots according to your own sensitivity and you, you, give a, you give a story as you experienced it. And sometimes you have collective stories, of course, um, because they become like a meme, you know, like a, or a tale or... And nationalistic, um, you know, narrative and all these things, but they still have a perspectival kind of uh, consciousness in them. They see things from one specific angle, uh, and we know that through the science of history, um, because historians they know that if they want to do a good job, they have to listen to all the parties. Uh, for instance, not a long time ago, I listened to, um, I watched them. Um, a documentary on how the American Indians uh, would have a narrative about what happened in the past, you know, 300 years. And you have a very, very, very different narrative about <laughs> than the, one, the one we usually hear uh, from the at school, you know, and the official uh, kind of narrative. And they talk about genocides and things like that, which you, you, you would never even hear this word uh, in the conventional dominant narrative. Um, so, 
Uh, also, you asked about, you know, what, sh what should we say about a painting or an, an equation, a scientific equation and all those things. Uh, in my own feeling or understanding, a narrative has a timeline. So if you look at a painting that, that looks like a cartoon, for instance, you know, with, where you go into a timeline and a sequence, then that becomes a narrative. Now, if you look at a painting that has no timeline in it, but it may create this narrative in you, another, another narrative in me, or in music, uh, then I think it leads to a more a perspectival thing. It triggers narratives. So I see the difference between those art pieces that have a timeline in, in, timeline in them, like they take you to specific steps versus those that then that can generate many, many different narratives or states of consciousness. Music does that, uh, many paintings do that, and so on. A movie does not do that, except some certain movies. We've seen recently some movies that have like simultaneous narratives at the same time. And the, I think of everything everywhere all at once, for instance, um, that has lots of the aperspectival consciousness um, in it and many other pieces of any movies. So I think that memes or concept vehicles or symbolism uh, has the potential for a perspectivism. And now in the technologies that we work on uh, and thinking of, uh, of course, um, of Holochain, it has the potential to support an a perspectival consciousness because uh, with the weaving of so many different signals and perspectives that you can uh, bring into the dance, that's, that gives the infrastructure, the infrastructural support for a, a perspectival consciousness. And if you put AI in this, um, and I talk about, of course, and you know, AI for the people and the, by the people, but when it looks at billions and billions of data points, it can see so many different narratives. It can see so many forms of clusters and patterns. And um, back to the sense-making thing, maybe AI in a distributed way can help to build a sense-making that we can't even understand ourselves. Like it has some kind of collective sense-making that does not even um, fall into words or storytelling, but some new ways that will provide you or me or everyone with the point of views that we need from our limited perspective. Because I can, as an individual, I can only have a perspective. I exist as a perspectival being. I can develop my perspectival consciousness as much as I can. And I try to do, and I've noticed, um, I've learned lots of things about this in myself. But every time I speak with someone else, I have to collapse that um, exactly like in quantum physics, you know, with a Schrodinger cat. I have now to downgrade that or to collapse that into some form of narrative that will fit the requirements, either the, to save my life or to have a better reputation or to become an honest person or whatever requirements I may, I may have. But I know that in my consciousness, I have an aperspectival consciousness. And I know that the evolution that I see, I, I feel quite positive about that. It leads to the evolution of our species toward a perspectivism and with a perspectival infrastructures or infrastructures that support this a perspectivism. And this sense making, as I hear you, needs to have this form of a perspectivism and uh, the combination of AI and holochain or holochain like technologies may bring that kind of awareness. And I feel like a monkey uh, in front of, you know, articulated an abstract language when, when I say that. We had those conversations also before, like new grammars for a perspectivism uh, will probably happen sooner than later. So just, just giving my, my feelings, I know I don't give it very precisely, just, you know, kind of, um, yeah, feelings. Uh, what do you think about what I just shared? I think I need a bio break. I'll be right back. <laughs> so I don't know about the whole AI stuff. I kind of want to leave that aside for this, um, argu this argument, this discussion, because, and the reason I want to is because it feels to me like 
uh, it feels like a shibboleth. It feels like a, it's not the right way to look at it. It's like hand waving. Um, or at least it's not the part that I'm interested for this thing. What I'm actually interested in is how humans can with each other and in their own processes come to increased collective sense making. And, and you can go and put that on some other software process if you want. Right. So I don't know. It's just, it's not different than, um, I have a Geiger counter. I can see something that I couldn't see because I have a Geiger counter. Um, or I have um, sensors that can average out and find a pattern in some particular piece of data. Okay, fine. So we found that particular pattern, but we still don't know what it means to have collective sense. Like that's okay, fine. So you have another agent that's producing a data point. I, that's why I'm talking about awareness channels. Whatever agents you want to have as awareness channels, if you want to include machines at all levels for those awareness channels, the point that matters is the collective of which we are already have so much access to so much awareness. What does it mean for us to actually have collective sense-making around that? So I want to leave that, the AI part to one side. You can put it back in if you want to later. Um, number one, that's the number two is what you're saying is about, I think this is an interesting place to go, the a perspectivism and narrative. So you're just, you're defining a narrative as something that has a perspective. A narrative is, is, is some kind of exposition over time oh, that comes from a perspective. Well, okay. So James Joyce and everything everywhere at once there are you can use narrative format in post traditional narrative ways like you said i guess i guess maybe like maybe what there there's this deeper question is what does it feel like to you to have sense made for yourself when do you think you made sense of something as an individual? And it's funny because you are already a collection of agents. So you are already doing collective sense making. It's just that you have a particular feeling of what it feels like to have made sense of something. Okay. So then if we have a bunch of people and you want to throw in golems or whatever else into there, what does it feel like to them when there's collective sense that's made? What does it feel like to the individual portions of your brain when it recognizes that collective sense was made of the different computing portions of your own brain, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, amygdala, all the different, just different components of them. There's some point where collective sense was made. And is that what emotions are? Is emotions the result of having collective sense been made in this collective being called a human? Maybe. I feel like you're pointing to a perspectivism, I think that is probably actually what I'm thinking of as collective sense having been made. When at the very least, all these, the, the, all these different perspectives have been laid out and we have some kind of tooling to see them as perspectives, which is why the groundings is one of the most important dimensionality of collective sense making, discovering the grounding of the individual perspectives of the individual sense makers. That that is what makes it be a perspectival is that you have some kind of canvas in which you can see the statements the units of awareness that are coming in, you can process the units of awareness into discovery of the groundings and discovery of the dimensionality of the space that the awareness is about. And so what is that doing? Dimensionality of a space allows you to literally inhabit that space. And the groundings help you see what that dimensionality is and, and expand that in that like so, so the opposite of pers of a perspectivism. Perspectivism is sitting along a particular axis of a space, 
It is being in an axis of a space. So a perspectivism must mean having awareness of all of the orthogonality of that space. Well, there you go. So therefore, the process by which you do collective sense making must be something that reveals the particular orthogonality of the inquiry space and has awareness of the orthogonality of the sense makers at the same time. Then you have then you have collective sense being made because that orthogonality shows up inside the system. It's capable of, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if this is right, but my story is that the world or particular domains in the world, in the universe, particular areas of concern have particular dimensionalities. They actually exist. There's a shape, there's a geometry to the space. And there's something about either individual beings or collective groups of beings being able to interact with that geometry because they've actually correctly mapped out the geometry that then you get high resonance and you get capacity. And so to me that this is, yeah, that's what it's for is discovery of the orthogonality, the dimensionality. So that then one can choose to act inside it. That comes later. So I think that speaks to your A perspectivism, right? I think it totally speaks to A perspectivism. Uh, and I think we also uh, agree to bring an important um, nuance also that collective sense making doesn't come as a consensus or an average of things or an alignment to one vision. That as, as an emergent property, just like um, my own emotions or my own sense of coherence comes with as an emergent process, not as a debate and form of consensus inside myself. Uh, it comes as a new Holland. Um, so I think this process of emergence to another level, uh, we should keep, keep that in mind. And um, as individuals, Having uh, a nar narrative structure ingrained in, uh, you know, in, in our very fabric, in our very brain, because we tell stories, we, we exist as storytellers, uh, at least in our communication channels, like like what we do right now. Um, we will probably connect to uh, collectives that have this um, emerging sense making, just like the Schrodinger cat. Like he has this huge potential for every every forms of position, but every time, as an individual, I talk about it, then I precipitate that, <laughs> I collapse that into you know um, like a, a particle position or a speed of a particle um, be, as the observer of that. I have this feeling that we will have more and more of these collective objects that we feel deeply connected to, that we can relate to. That we will that will provide what we need as individuals to, you know, tell me, uh, suggest what I can do, uh, how I can exist in this collective, with no one understanding, having a one, you know, understanding of the of the whole thing, a one narrative. Or so, um, I see it as a as an evolution, like a, a, where we talk really about social bodies uh, or living systems. Um. Yeah. Well, what do you think about that? Well, I think we're probably already there. We already don't know. We already don't mm -hmm. understand. I agree. Uh, and I think part of the problem has to part of a part of our problems have to do with the fact that we think we do. I know. And, and then so then what that moves me to is the whole question of grief. How do you deal with the fact that we don't understand? Mm -hmm. That I think that that we have a ton of pain around that. I know I do. Like the the fear, the pain of not understanding.
And so there's something that will, I, I, I do feel like part of the story of all of the stuff that's happening is, um, or lies in the capacity to be okay with that. Something happens at a large scale or a small scale or both that makes that not feel scary or something. Well, it, it won't make you feel scary if you feel safe in it. Like if it provides you with what you need, um, where, where you can feel, uh, where, where you can feel that you can still listen to your inner GPS, uh, guidance system, something that connects you to, to that greater whole. And it doesn't look either dumb or, uh, senseless, um, or nihilistic, you know, like it doesn't care about giving up lives and, and killing masses of people in the name of a greater kind of thing. Um, so if you have this feeling and you know that all you have to do, you have to remain yourself in the deep listening of yourself, of your true self, your um, joyful creativity, uh, your creative power um, with that sense of connectedness, then why wouldn't we want that? What do you think? Sure. Um, sounds great. <laughs> I'm I'm not sure that I believe that there is such a thing as a true self. That that phrase doesn't sound right to me. The other things you said sounded right. Creative power. Mm -hmm. Um, there's something about yeah. Well, I don't know. So yeah, that would be good. <laughs> well, what if I say authentic self? Does that resonate better? Uh or or yeah, because what, what part of you is inauthentic? Uh huh. I feel like all of the things that we do are our authentic selves. It just depends which level, which which little fragment of ourselves did the thing for whatever reason and how it fight fought against another part of yourself. Okay, so I I should say something more more precise because uh, talking about true self or authentic self. Uh, presumes or implicitly says that such a thing as an isolated self exists, which I don't believe either. Uh, first, because for instance, I, you know, even in, in my intimate thinking, I think with the language and the language has uh, already processes of thinking for me, uh, <laughs> structures um, that have, I haven't decided. And also the more I investigate in what I would see as the self, and the more I see it as a, just a crossroads of so many, so many externalities, uh, whether we talk about beliefs or, or even the, the waves of the matter that goes through me and the chemical processes and all those things. So I can still feel a locus, you know, a local thing that has a temporal shape, just like a wave. Um, and I see myself more as a wave. And yet I can still listen to some kind of guiding process um, operating inside, which I want to listen to, which I would call the, the authenticity in that sense. But it goes to a matter, a matter of definition, of course. Hmm. Why do you think? Um, well, for me, the problem with true self and authentic self seems like those words presume that we exist as many selves, which I actually feel is correct, but that some of them are more real or more correct than others of them, which I do not believe. You may want one more or than the other one, or you may have a part of you that wants one, or one may speak louder than another at a given moment. Um, and so I know that when you were, what the thing you just said about the thing you want to listen to that guides you you want to call that the authentic self okay it doesn't seem like it's the authentic self it just seems like the one that the you that is in charge of listening is choosing to listen to because you like it better than the other ones for whatever reason it makes you feel smarter more evolved whatever it is and you happen to like to feel evolved and in, unless you're trying to say something deeply ontological that 
that some of our awarenesses run deeper than other awarenesses and there's a deepest awareness that one can get to. Maybe. I definitely do see that the some of the voices in my head or some of the motivations that I have came from things that I didn't know lived underneath them. But they all feel real, worthy, all exist for reasons. All of them feel authentic. And so the thing I hear you talking about sounds much more like Buddhist stuff of the watcher behind all of the, the things. And yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. As soon as you do that, then there's a watcher behind that watcher and just becomes a story. <laughs> and where did you go? Yeah. Thank you. Found you. I think they created a tangle that creates uh, assessments of different, different parts of the being. And I'm not sure I want to play that game. I see why it's useful. I kind of like that. There was a time when I was really into that, but there's a part of me that feels like, eh, <laughs> I want Seems to that I with all of those those beings in my brain also as part of this game of collective sense making. What is the grounding behind all of them? What is the dimensionality behind all of them? Not one of them has a deeper ground than another. They all have relatively interesting forms of ground. And how do I play collective sense making with my own internal psychology? Well, it seems I just heard a watcher here. <laughs> like noticing that it has lots of voices in the inside and the kind of parliament and a, a big mess and multi-level so it, it looks very much like a watcher talking yeah but it's one of them it has no yeah. privileged position over the other ones mm -hmm. does it so one one has i like that the other one has an awareness so it it just feels like one of the awareness channels is the channel that's aware of other channels, but that's just one of the channels. Why does that one get privileged? That one tends to, in my experience for myself anyways, that one tends to be the arrogant asshole uh -huh. because you can see everything. And I have the frame of frames. I know what's going on. Look at all of you doing your things over there. And I'm laid back, right? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Like, there, I one of the things that I feel like I'm I'm learning in this particular phase of my life is how valuable some of the ones that have a particular perspective are, and allowing them to come up as fully as the a perspectival one. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I could be wrong. Maybe that one has privilege, and I'll be more evolved if I like put that one in the front of the podium. <laughs> Well, it seemed that I heard, again, a watcher talking about the lack of honesty of the watcher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's oh, watchers all the way down, buddy. <laughs> watchers all the way down. <laughs> uh, Until the one which... that was not watching is the one that is most true, because it's <laughs> just itself. Well, I, as for my own experience, I... Um, I have that experience of, of uh, a perspectival watcher, some some watcher totally silent, not speaking, not speaking to, speaking to me uh, with a voice, not speaking to you. Um, so pre language, uh, and yeah, a silent observer. Um, and yes, I agree. Every time I want to make the silent observer speak then I collapse it into some form of temporal narrative, which has the limited perspective uh, and uh, loses the perspectivism yeah. of it. So, but we could, we could go on and on with this, this question. Um, I, <laughs> You're but, just I talking mean, about the fact that the, that you yourself and me, myself, we are uh -huh. all stories in a library someplace that somebody's reading. And of course, the reader will never be able to talk to us because they're just reading the story and they close the book and put it down and come back to it later. So, yeah, fine. <laughs> <laughs> what a big mess. Human condition. <laughs> well, anyway, 
we go to the atomic level of um, of sense making there um, because if we talk about sense making for uh, humans, uh, it has human beings in them in this. Um, so maybe before talking about large groups, um, can you share about your your experience, for instance, in your Quaker community or intentional community? Like when you have like physical people um, in a small group sitting in a room, how do they build? How do you make sense making? What what experience do you have of building sense making? Let's start from that, from the original collective intelligence, the the small group uh, who has um, uh, a view of the whole, who has holopticism. What experience do you have of that? Well, I, I, this, part of the reason why I'm interested in this whole discussion right now is comes from the fact that the main experience I have of that is the experience where the sense making is collapsed with the action. So it's sense making for the purpose of action. And okay. I'm really interested in separating those two things out right now. Why? Because it feels like why? Because somehow it feels like the putting them together is decreasing both the range of power of action and the depth of understanding of sense making. It feels like mixing them to like it because it's obvious that voting is a really poor way of finding out what the sense of the collective is right because in a vote it's always about an action and it feels to me like there's something in there that's problematic like if you so you know the stuff that's going on right now about what do they call it um citizen councils so there's this all this work of citizen councils which is pre-work for voting that's interesting because then you left the vote you still use the vote it's a dumb thing but at least what you did is you created a bunch of range of dimensionality for the actors to absorb before they cast their collapse of the sense making into action so i think it's because of your whole collapsing thing like it feels like at the collective level, there should be a lot more time before we collapse down the processing of all the awareness channels. That's why. And so my my story, you know, locally in the community is, yeah, things went to hell in a handbasket because we couldn't, we we were only capable of acting from our individual sense making. I, I, I'm make, making it too strong for what actually happened here in my community. There was a lot of richness. There was a, some interesting things that happened, but a lot did not happen because we didn't have a capacity to sit into collective sense making. We didn't know what it meant to make sense as a body. We didn't like, do, are we using what, I mean, people talk about do your research. And what they mean by do your research is go find the authority who you like. Mm -hmm. They don't mean go make experiments. So the difference between experimentation and research, it's fine to find an authority who you like, but you, but it'd be a really good idea to know why you're choosing one authority over another authority. What is the grounding that's happening there, right? That, that whole process didn't happen. And, I, and there's like something about like part of the point is that even in our process, our sense of the meeting process here, the sense of the meeting typically is applied to action. It's like, what are the sense of the meeting so that we can act? And so the typical thing would be like, what is the sense of the meeting so we can decide what is, are we going to use masks or not inside the farmhouse, inside our, our community building? Well, that's a good thing to do to figure it out. But if you're coming with the end that you need to make a decision with first, you're already blocking the amount of collective sense making that you can make. 
And so I don't know, like you could talk about that with the jazz band or the soccer team or all the rest of the things. All of those things are in play because they're collective action that they want to make happen. I'm interested in the things where the collective act, where the collective action is has too much. We can't get there yet with what we're up to because we haven't figured out the dimensionality of the space. So it's in those spaces where I'm interested in going. I mean, and, and quite frankly, you want to talk about one of your concerns. Should we or should we not eat animals? How do you do collective sense making around that? How do you navigate through all of the value of history, all of the value of things? I know your sense making that you've made, but how does the collective do that when it, I don't know, it's a hard one. I, I cannot separate that from, from storytelling and the axioms or the core assumptions that people have. And in most cases, unconscious ones. Uh, either you know, given by cultural yeah. background, religion, um, parental authority, school, you name it, you know, all these things. Yeah. And when I have conversations with people, I always try to discriminate to understand which part comes from a theorem, you know, like a logical inference, you know, logical deduction um, that the person did based on which actions, axioms or assumptions um, before, that came before that. And of course, those assumptions may also come with uh, some forms of reason reasoning, but you have always go to some kind of core source um, when you start asking people. That. And I like uh, to have those conversations, those open conversations uh, where we can unfold and see in each other's, you know, our core assumptions and core belief system. So if you believe that, I don't know, um, that men have superiority to women or humankind has superiority to um, non-humankinds or any, any of those things as a core thing, then of course that will lead to completely different consequences, like the way you do schools, the way you work, um, the way yeah. you design a city, all those things. Um, up to, to the very way you, you you do things in your own house, <laughs> you know, like in your everyday mundane life. Um, so how do we how do we help each other to to see those things? And it takes time. And by the way, the voting thing, uh, I think, has a relationship to time. Like we have a timeline. We need to make a decision by this day, this deadline. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, and when do we have to surrender to that? You know, because maybe I don't know. Um, we will. We have seasons. We have you know climates. We have things like that. So we have like external deadlines. Like we need to make decision between next summer because you, we may have a drought, for instance. You know those kinds of things. Uh, yeah. Versus we need to make a decision because some some kind of artificial mindset that <laughs> we have that we can challenge as well. But the it seems that time. Uh, the relationship with time that we have is a very core role in unveiling um, those grounds that you, you talk about. Have you explored this question of time there? Mm. Um, not explicitly, but I think it's something that fits into the grounding. Right, in the sense that it's one of the groundings that we would have is that we have to do something by a given time, that mm -hmm. there is urgency. That would be one of the groundings. And so to me, I think it's the dimensionality. I'm not sure that in terms of sense making that time is itself one of the dimensions. I think our interpretation of time is fits into the dimension of groundings. I think I'm not positive, mm -hmm. but it's certainly crucial. When you're talking about these pro these assumptions, and this is one that maybe we can talk about at some other time, and I have to go soon. Um, <laughs> the other huge topic that's in my brain is the whole land weaving society stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I've been meeting with a local farmer who's a genius and a friend, and uh, and what 
he's he has a phrasing speaking of a concept vehicle of one of the prime assumptions of almost everybody on the planet is that people have the right to restrict access to other people um access to land without compensation where land means the resources that create life yes mm -hmm. so we have an assumption we have for some reason fall into the assumption that we have the right to restrict access to other people of other people to those things which give life without compensation i think it's a super powerful concept vehicle for describing the assumption of property mm -hmm. and that one is right there at the core of all of the issues right there at the core it, it might be one of the core ones because in, embodied in that is that is the that is unembodied of embodiment of supremacy consciousness yes well i see important conversations we need to have about what we call property and yep. time also i would like to um, go deeper in the question of time you know uh, how much i've have worked yeah. on this and uh, how much i'd like to i'd like to go deeper in the, those things about time but i want to well, remain aware of your own time of my time <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so maybe we should uh, stop this conversation uh, now so i'll just uh, stop the recording